to do what only you can. Jesus, help you.
testing one. There we go. All right. It is good to see you this morning. Welcome. All week I've been saying Smith Mills Camp, but welcome First Church to Smith Mills Camp. Are you glad to be here today? Amen. It's a little warm, but it is summer. It's the middle of August. In January, you'll think back to this day and think, oh, I wish I was back at camp in the tabernacle sauna, right? <laughs> Some are saying no. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Welcome. Uh, we just want to let you know a couple of things up front here. Um, we, uh, you can be seated for now because this will take me a second. <laughs> You are so obedient. Somebody told you to stand. Uh, masks. I know that we're outdoors, but we're still kind of clustered in here. So uh, if you would politely wear your mask to protect others. If you need a break from the mask, step out to the perimeters or to the edge. And, uh, you know, if you're not right near somebody, take a break from it. We know it's going to be warm today. Uh, so just, just be uh, considerate of others, if you would, in our protection of them. Uh, we want to mention too, Nazarene Christian Academy is trying to work with the state and the government to get reopened. So they're going through a lot of training this coming week. A lot of our people are involved in that. Uh, so what we've decided to do is we're going we're gonna to be out to camp one more Sunday. If you're part of First Church, we're going to be out here next Sunday too to give it one more week uh, for NCA to get kind of settled in. Uh, with the teachers and staff the kids aren't back yet but we're trying to get all the training and all that taken care of all this equipment up here needs to get back to first church uh here i go with the tears these guys have worked so hard this week <laughs> And they all have jobs. They're so committed to the Lord and to camp and First Church. So we don't want to overburden them. We're going to take some time this week to get things prepared. And uh, next Sunday, we be, we'll be out here one more time at 1045, just one service. And then after next Sunday's service, if there are some of you that will stick around, we're going to head over to First Church and begin just to set up chairs and stuff. Uh, not a lot of work, about 100 chairs, folding chairs. Some of the staging needs to be moved. Uh, but these guys are going to hang out here with some help to get all these speakers and things picked up. They'll meet us over there at First Church. If you help us out, we're going to treat you to pizza for lunch. <laughs> all right? So if, if we can get some help next Sunday, uh, you can join me at First Church after the service out here. We'll get everything moved back in and uh, ready for NCA that week. And then we'll be ready to go with services back in the air-conditioned gym after that, okay? Does that sound agreeable? Does it? Help us feel better about that, okay? All right, help us spread the word. If you're watching online this morning, welcome. We welcome you to the online uh, streaming service. Uh, so whether you're watching online or here, help us spread that word. We know that everybody doesn't see it on Facebook all the time or Instagram. Uh, so help us get the word out. We're here one more Sunday after this. Then we need help moving back, and then we'll be back at First Church, okay? So keep that in mind. Keep it in prayer. Uh, today, we want to remind you that later tonight, uh, we have our closing service here at, at camp with the Cashmans. Jonathan and Brittany Cashman will be ministering tonight for the closing service. And uh, the snack shack will be available after the service tonight. Not, not today after the service. There's no snack shack. Just tonight after the service, all right? Uh, keep in mind, of course, we're, because of COVID, we're not able to pass the offering buckets today. We're trying to be careful with that so everybody's not touching them and sharing them. So at the back of the sanctuary, sanctuary tabernacle, uh, the offering buckets will be set up on stools for you to give on your way out. Or you can go online. You've been doing that. A lot of you are, are online church today. Uh, nbfirst.org. There is a place there that you can give, a giving tab. You can text your tithe, nbfirst. Uh, you can text your tithe. Or Venmo. There's the Venmo app, nbfirst. Uh, and then there's always mail, 764 Hathaway Road, New Bedford, Mass, 02740. You can mail your tithe, your, your giving in. On the other side don't forget Smith Mills Camp. Amen. 
We love Smith Mills Camp. Uh, Smith Mills Camp has always been a big part of New Bedford First Church of the Nazarene, New Bedford International Church, Emmanuel Church in Wareham, Lakeville. We've all been heavily tied into this camp. So don't forget, our camp, we need to continue to support it and be, be this mission field in Dartmouth here. With that note in mind, uh, if you want to give to our camp, smithmillscamp.org. There's a donation tab on the camp's website. You can give that way. One more project, and I think this is the last announcement I need to make. Pastor Andrew can signal me if I'm forgetting anything, but uh, we also want to mention this tabernacle. I go again. This tabernacle is a special place. Right there is where I met God and He changed my life. And we want to continue to be able to use this tabernacle. It's the landmark of camp. It needs a new roof. If you look around, I don't know if you can see it too well, but you can see gaps of light coming through the walls. There's some decay of the wood going on. It's you know, it's over 100 years old, so we need to maintain it. So we've developed a roof fund. We need to re-roof the uh, tabernacle here. We're trying to raise 7500 That's a phenomenal, to me, inexpensive price because Sly Silva and Pastor Andrew have worked together to try to get us a great deal. That's for material only, but 7500 will help us to get the shingles and attempt to get this you know, taken care of. Uh, if you want to give on the smithmillscamp.org website, there's a, that giving tab. If you press donation, it'll give you the option of a general donation or you want to give toward the roof specifically. We're trying to find 50 people who will give $150. The roof is 50 square feet. So 50 people giving 150 will take care of the roof. Uh, we already have had, is Debbie Farney here? Uh, no, Pastor Andrew, I don't know. It, all right, we're already in the about 3,000 or something like that that's been given, so we need more. If you're willing to give, if you haven't been out here and haven't heard that, if you're willing to give, either that donation tab or see Debbie Farney, our treasurer. At the end of the service, she has the square for your credit or debit card or again in the offering bucket. Just make sure you mark it. Uh, camp roof or tabernacle roof, something like that, to let us know. If you're online, again, we hope you'll be part of that. We we want to do this. We even wouldn't that be miraculous during the COVID year if we were able to raise those funds and keep this tabernacle going? Do you believe me for that? Amen. I've already given my 150. Lou and I have. I hope you will pray about that or find a friend, maybe split it up four ways two ways but let's get it done all right all right enough announcements no you want more okay let's see wow i'm not that funny today oh, they're smiling just give me a kick off of here okay all right god bless you we're going to worship now let's stand together if you would as we enter in and let's have a word of prayer as we enter into worship today father we thank you Thank you, Lord, that we have options. We have uh, a tabernacle to worship in when we can't worship in a church building this week, Lord. We, we thank you for these holy grounds that we've driven onto and walked on this morning. And the same Jesus that touched people and raised the dead and worked miracles back in the day is the same Jesus that's here today. For you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Holy Spirit that met those disciples on the day of Pentecost and filled them with the Holy Spirit is the same Spirit that's alive and well this morning. And as we've come, Lord, I pray right now that we are hungry and thirsty for the move of God and for the Holy Spirit to fill us fresh and new, for we need that. In these days of trouble and trial, how we need the Holy Spirit to come and help us. So this morning, God, energize us, refresh, revive your people, we pray, as we begin now to open ourselves to you and invite you to come. In Jesus' name, we pray this morning, and everyone said, amen. Let's worship.
last song. Um, I should be a Dean Miranda because I'm, I cry all the time too. Um, <laughs> as Pastor Tim was up here talking before about the roof and all that needs to be done around camp. Um, and then as we were singing this last song, I just got so emotional. I just started picturing all the people that have been in this tabernacle, all the evangelists that have stood on this stage, all of the lives that were given to Christ here on this altar, the fact that we got proposed on this stage and got married on this stage, all the things that have happened in this beautiful building, all that God has done here, I don't want people to think, oh, here they go again asking for money. We have to keep God's things good. We can't just let things go to waste. Someone else will take care of it. Someone else can donate money. I know I know, I can donate, but someone else can too. I don't have to. I've thought that many times. I, this is, I think, my 12th year here. I started off as a camper, and then I, I became a counselor. This is my first year not as a counselor. And I've seen people give their lives to Christ. I've seen teens give their life to Christ. And don't take that lightly. A teen giving their life to Christ with all of the craziness going on in their lives. Don't think, oh, they're young. I've been through it already. They don't even know what's coming. What they're going through is a lot. Don't take it lightly. So when they decide to give their life to Christ, don't take it lightly. So I want you to pray about it. I'm not here to ask for money. I'm just, the God, I, I felt this knot in my stomach as I was singing. Like God was telling me, it's not about the money. It's about the lives. Because one small tree can knock this building over. But you know what? God has been having his hand of protection over this building for a reason. Because he has a mighty plan for this camp. Not just this building, for this camp. So when you walk around, thank God for the lives that have walked in this camp. The lives that have been changed in this camp has been changed in this camp and I refuse to take that lightly so as we sing this next song just just spend time with God just spend time in prayer and just listen just listen to what he's trying to tell you
or I should say as we were worshiping, I began to think of the, the magnitude of what we're saying. Think about the gospel message that the God of all creation, right, the ever-existent triune God, the God who existed before the foundations of the earth and had need of nothing, saw fit in his love to make mankind, knowing we were going to sin, knowing we were going to break the relationship that he created for us to have with him. And then the Son, the Bible who says, who is in every way God, who is the pre-existent God of all creation, came and died for you and me. And then he said, it's better for you that I go, because if I go, I'll send you another help of the Holy Spirit. The magnificent God of all creation not only created you, he didn't only fix it when we broke it, but then he came alongside us and dwells in us to carry us through until the day that we get to be in his presence forever. Church, can you lift a shout of praise to the God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, who literally is the answer to all we need. I was sitting there, and the, the story of Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones came to my heart. And God brought Ezekiel into a valley filled with dry bones, and he asked one question, and he said, Can these bones live? to prayer. And I just told you that the God of all creation, the pre-existent God who is and was and always will be, created you, he saved you, he fills you, and he will bring you to be with him one day. That God, the God who is above all things. And now we're going to go to prayer. And I have a question. The valley of dry bones in your life. The thing that you're waiting for God to move on. Can that thing live? We, we, uh, Jerry asked me if we would pray for him and his friend. So we're going to pray for Jerry and his friend. We're going to pray for our pastor. We're going to pray for my brother-in-law. We're going to pray for Becky. We're going to pray for Bill Eklund and Charlotte Serpentine. And there are others who, who are represented here who have a valley of dry bones in your life today. You have something that looks dead something that looks like there's no hope and I think the question this morning is can those bones live can God fix and bring life to those things that seems like there's no hope and the answer is absolutely definitively and without a question yes they can and so I want you not to focus on that valley of dry bones but I want you to focus on the author and the perfecter of your faith this morning I want you to focus on that God who created you, who saved you, who fills you, and who is your partner and will bring you into that place where we spend eternity in his presence. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that there is not a single valley of dry bones in our lives that cannot live. There is nothing in our lives that is beyond your repair, God. There is nothing that is bigger than you, Lord God. And so we just surrender all of these things to you. Whatever my valley is, whatever your valley is, Lord, we bring those things to you this morning and we trust you. We trust, Lord, that you can bring life and hope and healing and deliverance and provision to those areas in our lives that seem like there is no hope. And God, we confidently say in your presence this morning, these situations are not bigger than our God. The report of the doctor is not bigger than our God. The unanswered questions are not bigger than our God. Because we have a God who offers us hope everlasting. And your word says to come boldly into your presence and find help in our time of trouble. So this morning we come into your presence only because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Only because on that cross so many years ago, you declared it is finished. 
only because of what you did and not because of who we are or what we've done, but only because our identity, your word says, is hidden in Christ. Because of that, we come boldly into your presence this morning and we trust you to bring deliverance and healing and provision and wisdom and knowledge in all the areas of our lives. I pray, God, that you would speak to your children today. And we thank you, we praise you, we give you glory and honor because you are good. In Jesus' name we pray. And church, would you lift a shout of praise to God because he is worthy. God is good and all the time. God is good. It's not camp if we don't say that. Thanks, guys. So I want to share with you uh, this morning from God's word. And I want to encourage you. I'm kind of, kind of continuing on a theme that Pastor Tim had shared um, a few weeks back on the influential church. Um, but as these things often do, my, my message has kind of grown and transformed throughout the week. And um, I want to take you to John's Gospel, chapter 6. I should have had it marked. I say that every time, and I never have it marked. Someday I'll learn. So it has been a, a great year here at Smith Mills Camp, um, and I, I think that uh, most of you, if, if not all of you who have been here, would agree that God has moved. Uh, we have seen souls come into the kingdom, and that's why we do what we do. We do it here. We, we worship God here. We preach the gospel here for, for three purposes, um, as stated in our bylaws, and those are to see souls come into the kingdom to see people experience sanctification and freedom from the power of sin and death in their lives, 
and to offer a place for the Church of Jesus Christ to come together and to worship Him in unity. And, uh, and we've done that this year, and it's been a great camp. Um, and our attendance has ranged, uh, as of when I wrote these notes, anywhere from 83 to 118. Um, and, uh, and several dogs. I get, I get the count of dogs every night as well. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and this same time last year, we had services that ranged anywhere from 96 to 242 in attendance. So why do we call this year a successful year if our attendance dropped by half? And the reason is because I believe that our metrics, metric for success is changing. And uh, up until recently, we would measure success by the number of people that we could gather. Right? However, now that gathering is limited, we're first, we are forced to reevaluate what success looks like. Right? So at first, we, we, we looked at, and, and we, we kind of looked at optimistically at our Facebook pages and our YouTube pages and our Instagram pages and went, wow, oh, we're getting 900, 1,500, 2,000, 5,000 views. Right? No, until we realize that those are three-second views. And they really don't mean much of anything. Because when you do a little bit of digging, you prove that those three-second views all add up to about 40 people who are watching the whole service all the way through. Maybe a little bit more than that. But in our attempt to kind of hold on to our old measuring rod, we've missed the fact that the size of the crowd that's gathered was never the measure that Jesus used to determine whether or not his ministry was successful. And so I think that we have been forced because of COVID to reevaluate the success of our ministries because gathering a crowd isn't always the answer. Early on, I, I sat, with a, uh, uh, sat on a Zoom call, and I've, I've been part of a Zoom call um, for about for about three or four months now with a, a, a Nazarene evangelist by the name of Dan Bohai, Becoming, Becoming Love Ministry. And uh, he felt uh, early on in, in this pandemic that he, you know, his ministry of traveling was suspended because of, of uh, you know, the reality that, that we can't travel. And so he thought, well, how can I serve the church? And so he prayed and he felt like God led him to start this Zoom call for pastors from all over the nation to come together and just to be transparent with each other and to pray for each other and to pray with each other. And the first time that we met, he asked a question and his question was, how successful is your ministry? Remember the metric, right? The metric was how many people we could gather. And he said, I'm going to ask you a question. Would 10% of your church go out? And make a disciple right now. He made us all answer. So that's for, no, actually he said 20%. Would 20% of your church go out and make a disciple right now? So for us at the time, First Church was averaging about 230 to 250 people on a Sunday morning. So that means anywhere between 46 and 50 people. Could I confidently say that 46 to 50 people in our congregation would go out of their way to make a disciple? No. Pastor after pastor after pastor after pastor had to answer the question, no. And so the question is, how successful is our ministry? If we are not making, as John Cashman's been saying all week, I told him, you're stepping on my toes, buddy. If we're not making disciple-making disciples, then is our ministry really doing what it's supposed to do? So I want to look at Jesus and the way he dealt with crowds. And so we're going to go through John chapter 6. It's 71 verses, and I'm going to go verse by verse. Uh, so that's why I'm sitting. Uh, but we're, we're, going to, we're going to go through, and I just want to try to paint a picture here for you. So it says in verse 2, A great crowd of people followed after Jesus because they saw the miraculous signs that he had performed on the sick. And Gill's exposition of the Bible says it this way. They came after him because they saw miracles which he had done on those that were diseased. So that it was not for their sake of his doctrine or for the good of their souls. 
but they followed him either to gratify their curiosity in seeing his miracles or to be healed in their bodies as others had been. And Jesus knew this. He knew that this crowd did not come here because they were his devoted disciples. And if we as a church can gather 500 or 1,000 people and yet 10% or 20% of those people won't go out and, and make disciples, then maybe the crowds that we have so often evaluated as success are actually like the crowds that Jesus spoke to. And here Jesus says something very interesting in verse 3. It says, Then Jesus went up on a mountainside, and he sat with his disciples. We had a crowd gathering at the foot of the mountain. You know what a pastor does if a crowd gathers? He grabs his Bible and maybe an offering plate. <laughs> he says, oh, my, my ministry is growing. I'm getting successful. I have influence. You know what Jesus did? He turned his back on the crowd and went up into the mountains with his disciples, with the twelve. This occurs about a year before the crucifixion. And it is one of four withdrawals that Jesus took with his disciples. And according to Dwight, to J. Dwight Pentecost, in his book, The Words and Works of Jesus Christ. Actually, this is one of my favorite books, and I remember being in college. I got this book in college, and everyone hated it. But I love it. I go to it almost every sermon I preach. But anyways, it's called The Words and Works of Jesus Christ. And he says the cause for these withdrawals, these four times that Jesus took his disciples up into the mountains or he took them away from the crowds, were, for, were multifaceted. It was because of the hostility of the Jewish leaders. It was to find rest and recreation for his, his team, his 12 tired workers. And they would go up into the mountains away from the tropical heat of the lowlands they would report their work. They would give testimonies. Jesus would say, okay, guys, how'd it go? How did your ministry go? And they would share what they did while they were out ministering to people, casting out demons, laying hands on the sick, and preaching that the kingdom of God was at hand. He would give them special instruction and training. They would escape the fanatic popularity in which they were desiring to make Jesus a temple king. And he was also hiding from the jealousy of, and trickery of Herod, who had just killed John the Baptist. And so Jesus was in the thick of his ministry, but he knew it was coming to an end. And he knew that in about a year's time, it was all going to be on his disciples' shoulders. And so you think, if Jesus knows that his, his ministry, his earthly ministry, is about to come to an end, why didn't he get out and share all of this insight with a crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children? So there are estimates that this was crowd, crowd was up to 20, 25,000 people. So why wouldn't Jesus have gotten into a boat like he normally did to amplify the sound of his voice and speak to this crowd of 25,000 people to share all the intimate insight that he had for, his 12, for the 12? But instead, he turned his back on the 25,000 and he went up into the mountain with the 12 to pour into them. And it's because Jesus knew that the twelve's lives would be transformed and they would transform others' lives, whereas he knew that the crowd of 20 or 25,000, they were just spectators. And so our metric for success has to change. If I can gather 5,000 spectators but not a single discipler, then my ministry isn't successful. But if I can gather 10 disciplers, disciples who are disciplers, then I have an exponential impact in the world around me. See, Jesus wasn't disinterested with the crowd, right? So verse 5, when Jesus looked up and saw the great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He wasn't disinterested in the crowd, but he did know their motives. And so actually, if you look at verse 6, Verse 5, sorry, it says, where should we buy the bread for these people to eat? And it says in verse 6, he asked only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. See, Jesus had a concern for the 5,000, for 20,000 or whatever the number is. But still you see what's Jesus' heart here in feeding the 5,000. 
He's testing Philip. Even in ministering to the physical needs of the 5,000, he's ministering spiritual insight to the 12. Because he's teaching them that whatever they bring to him, he can multiply. Right? Taya came up here last night and shared a beautiful um, commentary before her prayer. And it was that God has called her into ministry. And she knows that Taya has nothing to offer God but herself. That's what Jesus was teaching these, the 12. He said, what do you have? How are we going to feed them? So even Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 was intended to be a spiritual lesson for the 12. His attention is still mainly on the 12. Because Jesus knew that the return on his ministry was to pour into the 12 and not the 5,000. So he says, while the, miracle, while the miracle was performed to satisfy the physical hunger of the crowd... Jesus was primarily instructing the 12 concerning the nature of ministry for which they were being prepared. The 12 do, did not have the ability to meet the spiritual or physical needs of the people. But when they make available or when they made available what they had to Jesus, he could multiply it and use it to minister to the multitudes that they were going to continue to minister to. Right? Jesus was always focused on making disciples who make disciples. So it wasn't about wowing a crowd of 5,000 with the fact that he could produce, 12, uh, you know, produce enough food for all of them to eat and have 12 baskets left over. It was about teaching the 12 that anything they brought to Jesus, he could use to bring about life and hope in the lives of the people they were ministering to. Because Jesus' focus was the 12. So if you skip to verse 22, between verse uh, 6 and 21, 22, um, Jesus goes across the lake. with his, He sends his disciples across the lake. And then he waits. The storm comes. He walks across the water, meets them on the, the sea. Jesus, uh, Peter gets out of the boat. They walk together. He gets into the boat. They're immediately on the other side. So this happens while the crowd is waiting on the other side. Verse 22 says, The next day the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore on the lake realized that the only, only one boat had left them and that Jesus did not enter with his disciples but that he had gone away alone. So then some of the boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum to search in search of Jesus. So after feeding the 5,000, Jesus sends his disciples across the lake. This is where he and Peter walk on the water and Jesus calms the storm. And then the crowds of people that Jesus had fed, fed persist. Statistics. I don't know where you're getting your st statistics from. <laughs> Whew, try that again. Persisted in finding him. <laughs> they actually camped out where Jesus had fed them. And then they got in boats and traveled across the lake to where Jesus was. And to you and me, that seems like devotion, doesn't it? And again, as a pastor... I'd probably go, these people really want to hear what I have to say. <laughs> Jesus wasn't deceived. Verse 25, it says, When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly, Jesus saw right through them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, the God, for on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. They pursued Jesus, but they didn't pursue Jesus because they wanted a life-changing interaction with the God of all creation. They pursued Jesus because they wanted another free meal. And although they pursued him with what seemed like religious devotion, 
he knew that they were only really coming after him to see what they could get from him. So as I mentioned before, the metric has to change. Because there are plenty of people who come to church day in and day out with what appears to be religious devotion who are simply looking to see what we can get from the church or from God or from those around us. Church, we still, this do, we still do this today, never really seeking to be transformed by the Spirit of God or renewed in our thinking in or in our, our, in our actions, but still coming to Jesus only when we need help. Right, we've, we've talked about this. I think every pastor who's ever preached has talked about the fact that sometimes we put Jesus on the back shelf until the world goes to hell around us and then we take him out and we ask him, Jesus, can you help me? Can you intervene here? That makes us no better than this crowd of 20,000 people who only sought after Jesus for what they could get. We seek after him not for spiritual change but earthly needs. I mean, how many of us are really coming to Jesus saying, Jesus, I want to die to myself. Would you change me? Would you root out of me those things that don't bring glory to your name? And would you cause me to be more like you? That's what we should pray. It's probably not what we're praying. We're praying, Lord, can you help me pay the rent? And can you provide me with some food? And Lord, if you could send somebody with an Old Navy gift card, that'd be convenient. But you know what Matthew chapter 6, I read it, I think it's Matthew chapter 6 says, I read it earlier this week, it says, don't worry about what you'll eat or what you'll wear. The Bible says, the Bible says those are the things the pagans worry about. When all we ever approach God for is what we'll eat, what we'll wear, what he'll do for us, we're actually thinking like pagans. He says, seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all of these things that you need, they'll be added to you. So church, my question for you this morning is, are you just another face in the crowd? Or are you like one of the 12, seeking really to be transformed by God, seeking to be changed, seeking to bring change to somebody else's life? John chapter 6 continues in verse 28, and he says, They said, they asked him, what, was, what must we do to do the works that God requires? He said, Okay, Jesus, what do we need to do? What do we need to do in order to keep getting bread? And Jesus answered, The work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. Basically, place your trust in me. Place your trust in me. So they asked him, what sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? (laughs) Come on, the audacity. Okay, Jesus. I mean, you heal people, you deliver people, you're, 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 you're making waves all over the place. There was that free meal last night. But what sign are you going to give us now, today, that we would believe? Because our ancestors, they ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Still looking for food. (laughs) Right? Prove it, Jesus. Prove it. It has been said that the greatest miracle that that Jesus will ever do in any of our lives is to save our souls from the pit of hell. Right? And I would agree with that. To take a sinner and save them and make them a child of God. That is an incredible miracle of God. And you know what we do? Prove it, Jesus. We continually come to him and we say, prove yourself. If you're really the son of God, you'll do this. If you're really the king of all kings, you'll answer this. Meet my need, Jesus. Because if you don't meet my need, I'm not going to believe in you anymore. Right? Don't we do that? So are we just a face in the crowd? Or are we one of the 12? You know what Jesus said to to, to Peter when he found him? He said, leave your nets, leave your well-being, leave leave everything you've ever known to provide for yourself and follow after me and I'll make you a fisher of men. (laughs) Huh? What does that mean? Because if Peter was thinking like a pagan... He would have said, well, Jesus, how am I going to feed my family? 
Well, Jesus, how am I going to pay the bills? Well, Jesus, can't I do that while I'm here fishing? I mean, I can preach to my fellow fishermen. No. God said, go, and he said, okay, let's go. They were still looking for a sign. These are the very people who followed after him because of the signs that he did. Yet they're still looking for him to perform for them. Do you know what crowds do? They make Jesus, they make God perform for them. So when we were gathering large crowds, were we looking for God to perform for us? Or were we willing to die to ourselves to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Church, it's time to stop waiting for God to perform for us. And it's time to start dying to self and serve the king of all creation. Jesus said to them in verse 32, Verily, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who gave you this bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Still thinking of their bellies. Always give us this bread. Verse 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. Verse 41 says, at this, the Jews then began to grumble about it because they said, I, because he said, I am the bread of life come down from heaven. They said, is, not, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I came down from heaven? They, didn't, they weren't believers at all. They weren't believers at all. Church, for too long, we've been distracted by crowds, thinking if we could fill a church, it was a successful church. If we could fill a, a stadium, it was a successful conference. Jesus saw right through them. They said, Jesus, what can you give us? And then when Jesus said, I can give you me, they said, yeah, are you really what we need? That's not what we need. We need some more bread. He goes on to say, very truly, I tell you that the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. This is verse 40, uh, verse 49. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. You have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up in the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real, li is, is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them." Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. So Jesus says to them, you're still focused on bread. Your ancestors ate bread, and they died. But what I'm offering you is me. And if you choose me, I'll give you eternal life. And you know what? And we think about this, right? And it's really a bizarre statement, right? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. But if you think about what Jesus was saying, he's saying whatever you eat becomes part of you, right? If I ate McDonald's every day, all day, it'd change me. Right? It would change me. And, if I, and, it, and on the, the opposite side of the spectrum, if I ate a healthy diet of lean meats and fruits and vegetables, it'd change me, because that's not what I eat now. And in the same way, what you eat and drink becomes part of you. Jesus is saying that his teachings must become part of his hearers in order for them to have eternal life. But they just wanted to be a face in the crowd and get some bread. 
They could not simply follow Jesus for the blessings while continuing on in their lives as they had done for so long before. And church, that's what so many of us are still doing. Let me live the life I always live, but if I go to church on Sunday, it should make a difference. Didn't make a difference for the crowd. Verse 60 says, On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And Jesus turned to the twelve and said, Do you want to leave too? Now remember, this is the twelve that he took up into the mountain. This is the twelve that he's been pouring into. This is the twelve on whom he breathed the Holy Spirit. This is the twelve that he sent out with the power over demons and the power to heal the sick. And this is the twelve that he called and he made them fishers of men. And Simon Peter simply answers to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The crowds were not devoted to Jesus as the disciples had become. They, only, they had only come to know him from a distance. They knew him as Joseph's little boy who somehow performed miracles. The twelve, on the other hand, had grown to know the love of Jesus. And they knew that there was nothing that could take his place. Church, are you a face in the crowd? Or are you one of the twelve? The crowd, however, when faced with the reality of life change, total surrender, and the rejection of the life that they always knew, they said the teaching is too hard. And they turned back. So I want to ask you again this morning, are you a follower of Jesus? Are you one in the crowd? Or are you a disciple who can hear the hard teachings and continue to pursue after him? The metric for success is shifting, and it's shifting back to what Jesus, how Jesus measured success. Gathering a crowd was enough to consider church successful. And now I think we are aligning our thinking with that of Jesus, because he's not looking for crowds of followers. He's looking for disciples who will come after him and bring others to him. Pastor Tim talked a couple weeks ago about the influential church, and he mentioned that we should be having an effect on the world around us in what we say and what we do and how we live our lives. And I immediately think of Acts chapter 2, my favorite portion of scripture is Acts chapter 2 verse 42 to 47 because it so beautifully describes the early church in verse 46 and 47 of Acts chapter 2 says this the early church of the early church they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer everyone was filled with awe at the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles all they all the believers were together and had everything in common they sold property and possession and gave to anyone who had need. And here it is, verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The early church was influential. The early church gained the favor not just of believers, but of everyone around them because they were different. I mentioned earlier that I have a Zoom call that I join uh, most weeks with, with uh, Becoming Love Ministries. And this week, uh, Dan Bohai posed five questions. And um, I want to pose those questions to you today because I believe that they are the metric or part of the metric for evaluating our success. So here are the, here are the questions can we trust the word of God? And I might add, can we build our lives off of or upon the word of God? What do you say? Can we build our lives off the word of God? Yeah, really? So everyone here tithes 10%? And everyone here trusts that God will provide for them even when there is no sign of provision? 
And everyone here knows that, that we should live our lives based on the moral code that God puts in his word, not because he's a fun ruiner, but because he recognizes that a life lived in immorality leads to destruction. Yeah, the amens get quieter. <laughs> Can we live our lives based solely off the word of God? Because 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. How much scripture? All scripture. Even the hard teachings? Even those. The crowd found some of Jesus' teaching hard, and they turned back. See, when Jesus was promising miracles, when he was promising healing, when he was giving provision, the crowd was happy to follow Jesus. But when he started with that death to self stuff, they were like, nah, I'm out. Is that us? When we're faced with dying to self and choosing Jesus' will over our own, do we decide that that's the part of the scripture that wasn't God-breathed or isn't necessary for Training up and equipping in every good work? Because these are the things that determine whether or not we're a face in the crowd or whether we're a disciple of Jesus. Because if we can pick and choose parts of God's word to follow and to believe, then can we really say that we are a follower of Christ? Or are we maybe a follower of our own design? What, we do, what do we do when we are challenged by God's word? Do we change it or do we allow it to change us? And that's the question that you have to ask yourself. And the answer to that question will determine whether you're a face in the crowd or a disciple of Jesus. The second question I have for you, there's five questions. These are rough. The second question I have for you is this. Do we believe that the gifts of the Spirit all of the gifts of the Spirit are in operation and should be operation in operation in the church of Jesus Christ today. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 says, Eagerly desire the gifts. Just as Jesus instructed the twelve that they needed an, his intervention to feed the crowd... That when we offer what we have to him and allow him to empower it, he can multiply it exponentially. So we need to understand our need to walk in the spirit and in the gifts of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit in order to have success in our ministry. What if Philip took the, 12, the, 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 the five loaves and the two fish and started handing it out without actually seeking the provision and the blessing and the multiplication of Jesus. How far would it have gone? A couple people in the crowd? Church, we're trying to do church without the Spirit. Because the gifts of the Spirit are a little creepy. Can we say that? The supernatural makes us uncomfortable. Because when we step into the supernatural, we have to step out of the natural. And I can't be in control of the supernatural. So I stay in the natural. When God speaks to you in a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, it's uncomfortable. When God leads you to lay hands on someone who's sick and pray, it's uncomfortable. But church, we cannot do church without the empowering of the Holy Spirit. If we are not experiencing the gifts of the Spirit in our lives, we might need to start asking why. And the answer probably derives from where you're drawing your strength. Because remember, if I eat McDonald's all day, I'm not going to be trim. The third question I have for you is, do we believe that we are actually called to be making disciples? That's a hard one. I'm not going to do it, but if I asked you to raise your hand, how many in here could say that they are actively discipling someone right now? Because the answer should be every single one of us. What if the 12 
The 12 that Jesus spent his time with, what if the 12 decided after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus that they were just going to go back to their lives and enjoy this relationship they had with God and never share it with anybody else? Because that's how we, church, that's how we live our lives, isn't it? We come to church, we get filled up, we experience the presence of God, and we go home and ignore that there are people all around us dying every day. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20 says this, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very ends of the age. Disciple making is not the job of just of the pastors. It is not the job of just the devout. It is the job of every believer to be duplicating ourselves. And as you can see from the crowd versus the 12, crowds don't make disciples. The 12 grew because they were with Jesus. The disciples of the disciples grew because they were with the disciples. Do you get where I'm going with this? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Every one of us has something to offer someone. Who are you discipling? And why not? I don't know enough. You know how to fix that? Get in the Word. Learn some more. What other area in our lives can we choose not to multiply ourselves? If, 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 every, if every area of our lives was based solely on the, the depth of knowledge, nobody ever have a kid. Because you know how much I knew about parenting when I had a child? I thought I knew a lot. Do you know how much I knew about parenting when I had a child? Nothing. Do you know how much I know about I have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old. Do you know how much I know about parenting now? Almost nothing. <laughs> I know a lot of ways to mess up. But I know that God gives me the grace every day to raise my children to love him and to love others. Church, we have become so addicted to our own strength and our own power that we don't know how to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to disciple someone else. The next question I have for you, the fourth question is, are we really supposed to do like things and greater to Jesus? These are getting hard, huh? John chapter 14, verse 12 says this. Very true. This is Jesus speaking. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me. Who's that? Is that you? Whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing and they will do greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. We still have work to do, church. How many of us are doing like things to Jesus and greater? We're not even doing like things. Forget greater. And the fifth question, my final, my final question for you today is this. Is the church really supposed to be a house of prayer? Because Matthew chapter 21, verse 13, when Jesus is clearing the temple, he says, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. So my question for you to this morning is, what have we made the house of God? Have we made it a community center? Just a place to come together? Have we made it... Um, a music hall? It's good music in church. Have we made it a counseling center? It's the place I go to get fixed. All my emotional baggage gets left there. Have we made his house a house of prayer? Have you made your house a house of prayer? I think this one gets me the hardest. 
This one hits me down deep. Prayer is an afterthought. Prayer is a thing we do when there's no other hope. You know when a pastor knows he's not going to gather a crowd? When he schedules a prayer meeting. Because there's nothing to do during a prayer meeting. At least when you come to a worship night, there's good music. Maybe, hopefully. When you come to church, there's your friends, there's a good sermon, there's good music, maybe there's a fellowship afterwards. But prayer night? I mean, all we do when we come to prayer is we sit in the pews and pray. We do that at home. I mean, we don't do it at home, but we could do it at home. But the Bible says where two or more are gathered, there I am in your midst. The Bible says where two or more are agreed on anything on earth, that thing is accomplished in heaven. I mean, our prayers are powerful, church. And God's house is supposed to be a house of prayer. These are hard teachings. That God's word should be the only foundation for our life. That we should be experiencing the gifts of the Spirit in and around us. That we should be making disciples who are making disciples. That we should be doing like things to Jesus and greater. And that we should be making his house a house of prayer. You know who did these five things? The twelve. I mean, not Judas, but he got replaced by Paul. The twelve. The twelve built their life upon the word of God. The twelve made disciples who made disciples, and you're here today because of it. The twelves walked in the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit every day. The twelve lived for prayer. And the twelve did like things to greet Jesus and greater. Because they were disciples and not just a face in the crowd. So these are hard teachings this morning. And so you have a choice. Will you turn back? Or will you say like the twelve, Lord, to whom shall we go? Because you have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus is coming soon for a spotless and glorious bride, the word says. A church devoted to him and to his word. And so my question for you this morning, this afternoon, are you a face in the crowd or are you one of the 12? Because our metric for success has shifted. And I know now, and you know now, that just showing up to church isn't enough. Sometimes you get to the end of a sermon and you go, where do we go from here? This is one of those moments because because my heart breaks. I'm not a crier. So my heart, my heart breaks and I don't weep. But I don't mean it any less firmly than Pastor Tim does when he weeps up here. My heart breaks for the state of the church. I mean, and it literally breaks. I find myself interceding on behalf of God's bride. Because church, we're not ready for Jesus to come back. And I read, and I read the word. And I read the, the story of the ten virgins. And five of them didn't make it. What if half of our church didn't make it when Jesus came back? Because we were too busy. That's what it was. They were too busy. They were too busy to prepare. 
Ah, we'll have time. The bridegroom's delayed. And we all thought that until March. And then we went, whoa, Jesus is coming soon. We're not ready, church. We're not ready. I read the word and it says that in the last days that, that these birth pangs that have just started will be followed by persecution of the church. And the Bible says, and many will turn away. We're not ready, church. Many are going to turn away. His word's not mine. I read the word and it says that when this gospel is gone to the whole earth, he's coming for a bride that is pure and spotless and holy and we're not ready. I read in, in, I think it's Matthew chapter 24, that many on that day will stand and he will say to them, turn from me, you worker of iniquity, because I never knew you. And these people will say, but we cast out demons in your name and we prophesied in your name. And he'll say, but only those who do the will of the Father can come into the kingdom of heaven. And what is the will of the Father but to make disciples? To be a disciple. I can't, I can't implore you enough this morning. We're not ready. And the time is short. And my heart is broken. Because I know that the word of God says that it is his desire that none should perish, but all should come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we have become so lethargic in our thinking that we can literally watch the world around us die and go to hell and we can chuckle at it. Right? We watch television shows that are full of debauchery. Men with men and women with women. Every form of, of illegitimacy and immorality and it becomes entertainment for us. The bot, listen, the devil's not an idiot. He knows if he can desensitize you to the things around you, then you'll no longer have a heart that breaks for the things that break God's heart. But Jesus literally died to set us free from these things, and we just don't care. Someone who clearly never had a relationship with Jesus dies, and we rest in platitudes like, well, he's in a better place. No, he's not. And he's not because no one told him. Go through the obituaries and look at the faces of people who are dying every day and going to hell because the church could care less about spreading the gospel message. And I'm not trying to guilt you. I'm just trying to excite you. We're not ready. My wife and I were talking the other night and, and we're looking through God's word and we're agonizing over the state of the church and we're coming to the realization that nothing else matters. My home doesn't matter. My clothes don't matter. My bank account doesn't matter. Take my truck, take my trailer, take my home. But give me Jesus and give me souls. Lord, please use me to spread this gospel message to someone. And I just want to know that there's somebody else who feels that way with me. But we can't get there if we don't base our life in God's word if we don't ask God to use his gifts to multiply the work we do, if we don't make disciples and do the works of Jesus and even greater and have a life of prayer, we don't get there. 
And someday, we're all going to stand before Jesus. And moments like this are going to flash in front of us. And we're going to be faced with the fact that we had to make a decision. And I'm going to ask you to make a decision today. I need you to decide if you're going to be a face in the crowd or if you're going to be like one of the 12. If you're going to go on living a life that you determine which way you go and how you get there. Or if you're going to choose today God's way, even when it's a hard teaching. So I'm going to ask you to, to do something public. And if you don't want to just be a face in the crowd, and you want to be one of, one of the disciples of Jesus, which means that you're committing to seeking after him and to make him known, I want you to stand with me. is so short and the work is beyond us the Bible says that the fields in the world are white that means when wheat when wheat turns white it means it's past harvesting it's over ripened the Bible says that the laborers are few but the harvest is plentiful there's not enough people to, to perform the harvest. So we should pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers. And so I'm asking you to respond to that call today and be a laborer. That this seeking after only what God can bless us with has to stop now. And instead we say, God, use me, whatever that looks like. Because that's the exciting life. Where God gets glory and his kingdom grows. Heavenly Father, we just we just want to pause in your presence this afternoon and recognize that we can't do this without you. That that crowd was looking for a way to continue to live as they had always lived but experiencing the blessings of following Jesus and that when the doctrine or the teaching became too hard they had no question but to no option but to turn around because God we know that we can't do this without you And so today we ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill us up. And you've already sent us out. Give us a passion for your word. Give us a passion for discipling. Give us a desire for the gifts. Give us a desire to be like you. Give us a passion to be in prayer without ceasing. Call us deeper, God. Because today we're drawing a line in the sand and saying, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. On that day, that soon approaching day, I want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. And whatever that means for this life, God, we surrender to you today. I lay my life at your feet today and I say, Jesus, it is no longer I li that live, but Christ who lives in me. So whatever it is that you want to do with my life, 
Whatever it is that you want to do with my ministry, whatever it is that you want to do, and wherever it is you want to send me, and to whomever it is you want me to go, I will go, Lord. Because God, I want to see your name glorified. I want to see it lifted up. And I want to see you draw all men and women unto yourself, God. I want to see victory. I want to see healing. I want to see deliverance. I want to see breakthrough. I want to see revival. I want to see a harvest, Lord. And it doesn't happen until your church goes. And so we're responding today and we're saying, Lord, here we are. Send us. We surrender our lives into your hands and we ask you to lead us and guide us and direct us and show us your way. And we ask you all of these things in your precious and holy name, Jesus. Amen. Church, I want to follow up this message in that prayer with the reality that it doesn't happen in your life if you don't change the people you spend your time with. The reason that the 12 were able to do these five things is because they spent time with Jesus. If you continue to only seek after Jesus in a crowd of like-minded people, you will never find him. But if you get into a small and intimate group of friends, start a Bible study in your house, get a prayer partner that you call every day, seek out someone who will walk with you as you walk towards Jesus, then you will be successful in your ministry for the things of God. The church needs to shrink, church. We need to get small again. Do you know that for the first 300 years that the church existed, it was just in people's homes? There were no cathedrals. There were no churches. They just met in each other's homes, and they encouraged each other in the Word. And they transformed the known world for Jesus. The church needs to get small again. We need to be together in prayer and in Bible study, and in the Word, and encouraging each other. So find someone that you can seek after the face of God with, along with you. And if you can't find someone, come find me, or Pastor Helm, or Pastor Tim, and we will help you find someone. Because my heart is for this kingdom of God to be here on earth as it is in heaven. And that doesn't happen if we don't do it together. God bless you.